worship tonight, brothers and sisters. Uh, on this midweek Lenten service, we'll be using the order of service that's found on page 54 in your red hymnals. I invite you to turn there now as we join together. Please stand. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Oh, God. 
continue our, our passion reading this evening where during these midweek um, services we focus in especially on the whole Bible is about Jesus but the passion of Jesus uh, is talking about the suffering of Jesus those specific 18 crucial hours that we focus in on to see the depth of God's love in taking on the depth of our sin and tonight we we see Jesus here before Pontius Pilate To avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat <clears throat> Passover, so Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves. Judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words of Jesus spoken, indicating the kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. Pilate then went back inside the palace and summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Do you think that I'm a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king, then, said Pilate. And Jesus answered, You are right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. And for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus made no reply, not even a single to a single charge. The chief priests accused him of many things. And so again, Pilate asked him, are you going to answer? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. But the chief priests insisted 
He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers of the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, because I have suffered a great deal today in a dream on account of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. This is the word of the Lord. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. Let's join together in praising God with our hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted, hymn 127.
grace and peace to you all from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Tonight on our midweek Lenten service, the focus in these crucial hours, these 18 hours of Jesus' passion, actually focus on Judas and what God teaches us about us and about him through this apostle. Reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 3 and 4. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver pieces to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said. For I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So far, God's word. One of the churches I was preaching at in this rotation, they found out that I had uh, was preaching on Judas. And they said, oh, poor you. <clears throat> Judas is a tough one, right? It, it, it's hard to find a lot of gospel in this section. Maybe there's a lot of questions that come to us from this section. Maybe, maybe not. But I think even if you've never considered Judas before, it, you hear about this apostle who's now standing here betraying Jesus, and maybe, maybe you thought this, how could that have happened? Judas was handpicked by Jesus to be one of his closest friends. Out of all the followers, Jesus picked Judas. And Judas got to stand before God and, and, and listen to him, and Jesus was this close to him. And he got to hear the word of God spoken to him like this. Judas got to see Jesus walk on the water and still the storm and feed the thousands, even heal the sick. And then Jesus actually, when he sent them out two by two, the apostles, Judas actually got to have the power of Jesus spoken by him and used by him to even raise the dead. Did you know that, that Judas actually got to raise the dead? How does this happen? One of the band of brothers ends up a member of the mob. One of his closest disciples ends up being the one, the one throughout all time in history that parents no longer name their children after. How does it end up happening? Well, I think I know why. I think you do too. Because this whole thing, this, this, this desertion, this turning away from Jesus like Judas did, that lives in you, that, that lives in me. Especially a part of your sinful nature. The very thing that the, that the devil loves to exploit in you and uh, like a worm or a snake, just find a crack in the door and slither into your heart and my heart. And, and for Judas, what, what was it? It was his love of money, the Bible says, right? He loved money. And the Apostle Paul tells us in one of his epistles, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. He goes on to say, some people in a desire to get rich have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That's how it happened with Judas, right? That's how it started. And whether it was a desire to get really rich or just a desire to get a little bit more money, this love of money pulled on Judas's heart like a magnet and just pulled and it tugged and pulled and pulled until before he realized it, it pulled him away from Jesus and pulled him and pierced him with many griefs. And now as I speak, you know, eternal grief. But Judas knew better, right? 
Judas had heard from the mouth of Jesus with those eyes looking right at him, Judas, you cannot serve both God and money. Judas heard Jesus say to him, your treasure is not here on earth, Judas, where, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Judas, your treasure is kept in heaven with me. Hold on to that. Or maybe Judas wasn't listening on the day in which Jesus said, it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. So watch out, Judas. But in the end, here he is. Now, if you're a little more unfamiliar with Judas, Judas was the money keeper of the 12 apostles or disciples. So he had, he held out of the bag of money that people would give their offerings to and support the gospel ministry. And so he took the money in and he took the money out to pay the bills. The Bible tells us at some point, Judas began to help himself to that bag of money, though. And to be charitable, as we should be, maybe it even happened innocently, right? Like maybe he was in a pinch, he got himself in a financial bind and thought, I, I just need to borrow a little bit of money from this bag. I will pay it all back, I promise. But greed and temptation and desire and the love of money and his sinful nature, they're all at play here. And, and then finally, we, we end up with Judas here. He's actually betraying, he's actually making a legal contract with Jesus' fiercest enemies to betray God for a, a bag of silver pieces. That, that's how we got here. But again, to be a little more charitable to Judas, maybe Judas thought Jesus was going to be able to get himself out of this jam. Maybe he thought, you know, the charges against Jesus are obviously going to be dropped because he's innocent, so I'll be able to make some money and then we'll go back to normal. Maybe he thought the crowds love Jesus so much, they're going to riot until they set Jesus free. It'll be okay. Or maybe they just thought, or Judas thought, I saw this man walk on the water and calm a storm and raise the dead and walk through crowds of people who wanted to stone him. He's going to get himself out of this one too. Ultimately, brothers and sisters, we don't know what was going on in Judas's heart when he betrayed Jesus. But tonight we're told what was going on in his heart after he betrayed Judas, Jesus. We're told this. When Judas saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. And with the bag of money still in his hand, he ran back to the leaders. And he said, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. And they just dismissed him and said, it's your responsibility. But then he, in that moment, seized with remorse, he turned away from those leaders he colluded with. And he even turned away from the money that made it all worth it. He left it there in the temple. And, and most devastatingly, Judas then turned away from the only one who could have truly forgiven him. The only one who could have set that that anxious heart at rest and got rid of that guilt and given him peace. He turned away from the only one who, arms wide open, to the very end had said, Judas, come back. Friend, would you betray me? The one who only truly loved him, Judas turned away from him too. And in the despair, Judas hung himself. If you haven't seen it by now, Judas has become the poster child for that verse in the book of James that says, each one is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. That's what happened with Judas, right? It started with just a desire. And that gave birth to greed, which gave birth to a sin, which now gives birth to death, eternal death. You can see how it happened. What about you? <clears throat> and me? I would like to think that would never happen to me. There's no way I betray God 
like that. I betray God to his face or behind his back for a bag of money? I would like to think that, that I would never fall into that temptation. I know better. We know better. We're here to hear Jesus' word. We love Jesus. We do. That's why we're here tonight. We love his word. We listen to his word. And we all have Judas' example as, as a cautionary tale. But we also have Jesus' words in the Bible that say, if you think you're standing firm, watch out lest you fall. And we all know what it's like to have a desire. You desire something or one thing or even many things. And you know what it's like when that desire in your heart turns into the one thing you need, at least in that moment, the one thing that will make your heart happy, the one thing you end up telling yourself you need more than anything else to, to deal with the disappointment in your life. You need that thing to deal with the devastation in your life, the depression in your life, the loss. You need that one thing to have purpose and meaning in your life. And you know what it's like when that desire doesn't go away. And it gets bigger and bigger because your heart becomes the perfect environment for it to grow and grow. And we know what it's like when we go chasing after that desire. It's almost controlling us. And we go chasing headlong into that desire, knowing full well the implications it's going to have on me and the people around me in my life. But in that moment, I don't care. I don't, I don't, do, I don't care. I just want it, and I do it anyway. We all know what it's like. To then be standing there afterwards, too. Like Judas, after we did the thing, getting what we deserve for it or whatever but to be standing there with that bag of money at dawn and thinking what did I just do how could I have done that we all know what it's like to be seized with remorse and guilt and shame and think how could I have done that how could I have said that how could I have thought that I knew better I'm a Christian. I know I shouldn't have done that, and yet I did it anyway. I chose to do it. What kind of Christian am I? Obviously one that doesn't deserve Jesus' forgiveness. Brothers and sisters of Jesus, do you hear his voice in these words tonight? There's a voice calling out to you in this text, and it's not me, it's not the pastor. It's Jesus. He's calling out to you. And he wants to remind you of the most important thing when you fall into sin. And then you feel remorse and shame and guilt. Jesus calls out to you with a heart full of love and says, Dear Christian, the most important thing when this happens, when you fall into sin and then shame and guilt, is not like Judas to go running with your, your money in hand and try to make things better or make things right or make up for it or try to cover over for it or whatever it may be because that doesn't take the guilt away. It can cover over it for a while, but it never takes the shame and the guilt away. No, Jesus says, when you sin, turn to me. Come running back to the one whose blood washes away every stain every stain. Jesus says, when you sin, don't turn away in despair and hopelessness like Judas. Turn to me. Confess your sins to me. Come running to the one who offers you full and free forgiveness, no matter what you've done. No matter what you've done. No matter what. Turn to me, Jesus says. Come back to me. Confess your sin and I will embrace you as, your, as a forgiven friend. Turn to Jesus in prayer and know that he will uphold you and hold you with his righteous right hand and forgive you, fully forgive you, and comfort you, and strengthen you, and guide you. There's going to be times when we fall into sin and just like Judas, we, then we get it. We see eyes wide open how awful our sin is, how, 
completely we're overtaken by our sinful nature and we're going to feel that shame and, and regret and remorse, that's not a bad thing. So long as it's not the only thing and not the goal of that is, is to, to turn away in despair, but as long as those things turn us back to Jesus and we come running back to the cross where you will always find the one who came and died for you to take away the sin of the world and you are a part of that world for whom Christ died. Turn to Jesus, and he will never let you go. Amen. And the grace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as we continue now with the Song of Mary found on page 57. <clears throat> In the closing hours of this day, hear us as we pray, O Lord. For the well-being of people everywhere, 
for the growth of your church in all the world, and for the strengthening of all who serve and worship here. We pray, O oh Lord. For one another, young and old, for your blessings that come with every stage of life, and for joy in doing your will. We pray, O oh Lord. For our public servants who work day and night to bring protection, justice, learning, and health to this and every place, we pray to you, O oh Lord. For favorable weather and bountiful harvests, for clothing and food, for health of body, mind, and spirit. And for deliverance of all sin and every form of evil, we pray to you, O Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us, who have shared with us your good news, whose souls are now at rest in your heavenly kingdom, we give you thanks, O Lord. In thanksgiving for your many and varied gifts to us, we now commend ourselves to your care. Be our shield and strength, O Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Be seated for our next hymn.
Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace, quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Glad to be here. Glad to those joining us online. Thank you for that tonight. Um, thank you to our company as well for edifying our worship with their music. Uh, just a, 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 again, a, a pleasure to be here with you. Every so often we get to do this. Uh, we've done these locations. These pastors love these locations, and I think our members do too. But um, I can probably speak on behalf of Pastor Schreiner and say, if you haven't had a chance to look at the Holy Week schedule, but just really plan for those really special services, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. Uh, they're, they're really not three services, they're really one. It's all one beautiful service, and so you, you can't come for just a part of it. you got to come for the whole thing, especially the ending, that glorious Easter morning. So uh, your pastor is looking forward to being uh, with you uh, and all your family here during Holy Week. And God's blessings. And, and, and to, uh, to that end, too, to assist you in that, there are some free and really well-done devotional booklets put out by our Synod, uh, NLC. And if you didn't see them on the way in, you can grab them on the way out uh, for Holy Week devotions this year. So. God's blessings to you, and God be with you till we meet again.